everyone. I, I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. My name is Carol Borzecki. I'm the Credentialing and Education Coordinator. I want to welcome you to this week's webinar. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker and fellow of the Academy, Dr. Adam Hogan. Well, I guess that's my cue. Uh, are we live, Kara? Yes, we are. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Adam Hogan. Uh, I want to welcome you tonight, and I want to thank you for uh, spending your evening with me. I know that the practice uh, can be very uh, difficult throughout the week, and uh, it's not easy to give up these evenings for a little bit of education, but thank you for being here to hear me. Uh, I uh, hope to make your evening worth it, for sure. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking about uh, two cases, immediate placement and load of the anterior maxilla from treatment planning to cosmetic prosthetic completion. Hold on a second. There you go. Uh, before I get uh, too started, uh, too far into this lecture, I'll ask that you uh, humbly take a moment and maybe today, tonight, decide to follow some of my social media at Full Implant Choice and Full Implant Choice Clinical on Instagram and also on the web at fullimplantchoice.com and a YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and whatnot. I appreciate your support. Uh, my biography in brief, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I wasn't um, always a blue collar dentist. Um, I used to be a blue collar Marine. Uh, these are, this is my boot camp picture here on the left side of your screen. Uh, that's a, that's a, a picture where they uh, slap a fake dress blue uniform on you that's Velcro to the back five minutes after thrashing you in a sand pit so that sand fleas can eat their lunch. Uh, and over here, this is me getting a meritorious award or some, some, kind, of, some kind of award or promotion, I guess. Um, I went to the University of Michigan after that, after the Marine Corps, and uh, went on to go back in the military. I went back in the Navy as a dentist, studied at Portsmouth Naval Hospital, uh, stayed in the Navy for three years, boarded the uh, LSD-48, uh, the USS Ashland, and then I went on to private practice, um, starting my um, credentialing tour with the uh, Medical College of Georgia Maxi course uh, down in Atlanta. Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank the AAID and ABOI and tell everyone out there, uh, non-members and members especially, to take the time to get your credentials. Uh, these, it's very important. And um, other than being a Marine, I would say this, uh, this, is, this organization has probably made the biggest impact on my career. So I want to say thanks to the AAID. In fact, these cases you see here on the screen are my three uh, cases for my associate fellow exam. Uh, that, that's my first implant I placed, my first quadrant, and my first full arch. There they all, and they're all doing fine in my practice today. So uh, please get your credentials and advance your careers. Continued on my credentials uh, with the AGD. I'm a fellow there in the Academy of General Dentistry, an honored fellow of the AAID. Uh, I'm on the Admissions and Credentialing Committee with the AAID, a board examiner there and a diplomate with the ABOI. In practice, you'll find me in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where I'm the owner at Full Implant Choice. I have a practice that uh, focuses on all phases of implant, cosmetic, and reconstructive dentistry. We do full arch, uh, all on X, all on six, teeth in a day, at least a couple of days a week here. And I have a surgical referral practice for area dentists, and uh, we focus in complex prost prosthodontics. I'm also uh, opening a lab called Seven Cities Dental Arts. Uh, so follow us more on that on social media as we get started. It's uh, operated as well by a CDT MDT, uh, turning out absolutely gorgeous work. So check us out on Instagram. Um, much of our focus is in full art zirconia, but we are, as I said, full service. I talked to you just uh, before we get going about friendship. Uh, it's a word uh, for a friend and a mentor. And anyway, I talked about credentials, but the other thing you can do other than uh, getting your credentials with the AEID is uh, to get yourself a friend and a mentor. Um, take the time to learn, put down the drill. Don't worry about your pocketbook or your paycheck and uh, go find somebody that you can learn from in your community. And this is mine. And I wanna thank you, Truman. So without further ado, I wanna get on to tonight's topic. Um, this is... Uh, I'll be showing two cases side by side and in comparison, uh, all about the anterior maxilla, extraction, immediate placement, immediate load, and final restoration. 
And this happens to be one of our two patients that we're gonna be focusing on today. And here's uh, one of my typical surgical setups. Before we start, I think we should define just a few terms. So I have just a few didactic slides here, maybe not more than five or six, just so we all understand what we're talking about. Um, immediate versus delayed placement. This is placement of your dental implant. You, uh, you have delayed placement with the, where you extract the teeth and hopefully with a bone graft and you wait maybe three to six months and then you place your implant. Then you have immediate placement where you simultaneously and atraumatically extract the tooth, bone graft around an implant that you placed at the same time. There are many benefits of immediate versus delayed. Um, and delay versus immediate as well. In delayed placement, sometimes you can set up for proper bone support or soft tissue support. Uh, you may potentially get a better restorative outcome, an easier case to restore by waiting. That all depends on the depth and angle of the implant connection and some other factors. And then there's uh, your immediate placement, which have other benefits that patients love, such as decreased treatment time, cutting your treatment time to four to six months instead of eight to 12. Uh, your decreased cost to the patient, decreased morbidity, one surgery, your patient acceptance uh, for, for cases. Uh, this is fast, minimally invasive, and at a lower cost to them usually. Uh, there are some contraindications to immediate, immediate placement. Uh, if you don't have five wall defect, um, then you may want to be careful and you may want to delay. Um, this is me around 1994, five, six at some point. I just put up there as a perfect example of a five wall defect <laughs> as a mostly a peaceful Marine Corporal right there. Delayed versus immediate loading. We talked about putting the implant in, then you can decide to put a restoration on it right away or you can choose to wait. In delayed loading, you may wait more than three months before installing or fix fitting a crown. Uh, the patient must wear an inferior provisional, such as a flipper, an interim RPD, if you will, or nothing at all, or they may have to wear an Essex retainer. Um, the timing is typically more than three months, four months, maybe up to six months. In immediate loading, you're gonna install your provisional right away at the time of placement. So the timing is basically on the day of surgery or within a few days after surgery, give or take. There are some contraindications and indications for both, um, for immediate loading especially. Um, and contraindications, it's patient selection, patient selection, patient selection. You have to trust that the patient understands what's going on, the risks, what they have to do. You have to trust that they're going to be compliant with your instructions. And there's that word trust again, um, and the patient understands everything that's going on and, and what you're trying to do there. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time in this case study on uh, systemic and age-related uh, factors, um, but you might wanna consider if they're a smoker or a daily smoker or a heavy smoker, if you wanna wait. Um, but local conditions are some of the most important. Uh, contraindications such as in a, inadequate bone or bone not or soft tissue not properly positioned um, or a lack of primary stability, in which case it's better to wait. Um, so your indications, pay, proper patient selection, um, making sure the patient understands their responsibilities. You have a healthy patient with adequate bone. And I, I should have highlighted this one too. Um, your desire to maintain soft tissue architecture. It's extremely important. Um, and of course, you must have primary implant stability, which for me is more than 45 newton centimeters. And uh, always better for me in these cases to have 60 newton centimeters of stability. So why not just immediately place every single implant? Um, well, there is a uh, higher incidence of failure that's reported in literature and across practices, um, sometimes discussing as low as one out of 10 failure, um, and God forbid more, uh, versus 99% integration for implants that you don't, don't uh, load right away. Um, you have to look at your patient again, consider, you know, do I really want to do this treatment on that patient? And consider the risk of a catastrophic failure. If you place a crown on an implant in good bone and it doesn't integrate or the patient functions on it, 
you might completely erode or lose the bone that you had there and support in the first place and uh, cause a situation where you have to create significant adequate bone volume for the next restoration. And you can push that treatment time out greater than a year. So yeah, sure, can I immediately place that implant? Uh, this slide, next couple of slides afterwards, um, this is a case that was referred to me recently uh, of a uh, anterior tooth. And uh, the desire, of course, was to want to place that crown immediately. Uh, but I have to stop and think and ask myself, if you look at that, uh, that uh, cone beam slice on the left side of the screen, it's got a, uh, it's uncertain if it has a buckle plate. So uh, I have to consider if I can extract that tooth, is the buckle plate going to remain there? Then I have to, to think about where is the available bone towards that, uh, the apex of that tooth and palatal of that tooth. What is going to be the restorability of the prosthesis? If I look over here on the right, with the planning of this implant, I see where I have to really engage that implant very far towards the palate to engage good bone support on that tooth. Again, that's even considering, uh, assuming that we're gonna save the buccal plate in this situation. But assuming we do save that buccal plate, uh, we place this implant, you know, what's the how's the provisional gonna come out at that kind of an angle? What's the final abutment gonna be? What's going to be the emergence profile of that crown? What are the long-term maintenance needs on an implant placed at this angle? And, and what's the likelihood of survival? All, all important questions to consider. So again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, in this case, uh, on the right side, you see the, the angulation before placement, and we're looking at a uh, restoration at a 45, 50 degree angle versus after grafting, where I extracted this tooth and we did not have a facial plate. It just simply was not present when we extracted the tooth. So immediate placement wasn't even an option. But I grafted this at the time of extraction. Then I was able to come back and place an implant with a screw retained crown prosthesis. A couple of pictures of that same case, left side of the screen. Uh, and right, oh, before grafting on the right side of the screen and looking at, I'm looking at the angle on that, on the right side of the screen, that arrow shows you coming straight through the facial of the crown number seven. And on the left side of the screen, after grafting, showing the crown with the uh, a hypothetical 10 millimeter abutment coming straight through the lingual of the crown at the bottom of that picture. So with treatment planning for immediate placement, uh, this is, that, uh, this is a, a similar case um, we have to have a proper treatment planning for success. Um, in this case, we did a, a delayed approach um, and later used a peak abutment to shape the papilla during the healing phase. Um, this is next to a pre-existing implant. That's not my implant. That's not a brand of implant that I use, but you can see how important it is to save bone at the uh, implant abutment uh, interface. Uh, it seems that that other implant had previously had bone more coronally positioned. And of course, you get what we expect with the bone level implant there, which is bone loss to that first thread. This is uh, my immediate decision tree for immediate placement and immediate load. This is just very simplified. Uh, at the bottom left of the screen, we've got a patient. We've got to consider their mind, their, their medical, their occlusion. Um, and in our consultations, we have to let them know that when the tooth comes out, we're gonna be evaluating the bone. Is it present facially and apic, abundant apically? And if it's not, we're gonna delay placement. And then we have to tell our patient that if we do have bone and we do place it, then we have to have good primary stability. And as I said earlier, for me, that's a 45 uh, Newton centimeter minimum. Um, it's a real time game decision. Uh, you can never go into the surgical operatory and promise that every single time you're gonna have an implant placed or a tooth restored on there immediately. <clears throat> in my practice, uh, I coined uh, this phrase and trademarked it and, and variations of it. I felt so strongly about it uh, that I trademarked it, but we treat people, not teeth. And this is all about the people that come into our, our building and, and how they're treated and how they leave uh, and, and less about the teeth. 
uh, because the three factors in my practice of immediate placement, immediate loading are the, the three P's. I think acronyms are important to remember things, even if, even if they don't fit perfectly, but if you have some quirky acronym, you can remember it. And they start with the people. Again, we treat people, not teeth. And the people person selection is important for these cases. Uh, and the second is the soft tissue, the papilla. And then the other third P, the papone. <laughs> Again, it doesn't have to make sense as long as you remember it, but you have to have bone present. So for patient selection, people that I would include uh, in this anterior immediate placement, immediate load, uh, they're missing one to three anterior teeth in the anterior maxilla. They're in pretty good systemic health and they're non-diabetic or not, or they're controlled diabetics at least. Uh, ideally non-smokers uh, for I rarely going to do the do an immediate uh, placement or immediate load on a on a uh, heavy smoker for sure. Uh, they have good oral hygiene. They have good occlusion. You've got to watch their overbite. Their bruxism, grinding, parafunction habits uh, are are um, not existent or minimal. And they most important they understand the risks of immediate load uh, and they understand what's expected. Uh, you know when you say. You have to have a soft diet. You can't pull on your front teeth for four months. They understand exactly what that means. And uh, with just a little bit of explanation. Exclusion criteria for me, they're uncontrolled diabetics. Number one, they're significant heavy smokers. Um, they've got some kind of a dysfunction, systemic dysfunction that may impede healing um, or they're immunocompromised. Uh, anybody with poor oral, oral hygiene, if you think they're not going to keep your provisional clean, or if they don't have good oral hygiene, they may in general not be very compliant with your instructions, so you may want to avoid that. Uh, their occlusion, uh, maybe they have deep overbites or anterior crossbites, um, and they have uncertain, uh, you're uncertain about their compliance with their instructions. Again, we said earlier that just because we can doesn't mean we have to. Here's a, a case where we considered that it was possible, but as I look at this individual and I look at his, first of all, I look at his uh, muscles of mastication and how very strong he is. Uh, and I look at his evidence of wear, bruxism and grinding. And I look at him closed down and with these very short teeth. And I realize that he's probably, uh, more than two millimeters overbite with minimal overjet, it's gonna be very hard to fabricate a provisional that can stay out of occlusion on this, this patient. With all those warning factors present, um, if, even if he didn't have those warning factors and contraindications present, I'll tell you, I uh, said to this patient, if we can put a tooth on there, you can't chew on it, uh, for four months, you can't have any heavy occlusion on for four months, you have to have a soft diet. And he says, what, did, what does that mean? And I said, as I say to everybody, well, mostly you can't do anything to pull with your, you know, you can't eat any finger foods. You can't tear anything with your front teeth. And, you know, when he says to you again, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, just has no clue, really kind of doesn't really understand what you're trying to say. It may be a good idea to uh, do a delayed loading on that case. So in that case, there were, there it was, we started that case earlier. Um, I said I extracted it and uh, built the facial plate up with some bone graft, was able to place this implant at a more ideal angle. Um, so there in the middle of the screen is our, uh, our membrane that we typically leave exposed for six weeks before we pull it out. Uh, again, we bone grafted that, set up that, that ridge. And on the right side of the screen, we see uh, uh, the soft tissue when we went back in four months later, and it has a very convenient little cleft <laughs> where we want to have the uh, crown later. And there on the left side of the screen is an implant. It's a uh, neodent uh, Grand Morse Aqua Helix, probably about a 13 millimeters, if I remember correctly. And the screw you see in the top is the modifi modifiable abutment that uh, you can place on the implant so that it doesn't uh, interfere with the provisional, which in this case was an Essex retainer. <clears throat> uh, just showing you that an example of that abutment that we use there, um, that's the uh, Neodent uh, custom customizable healing abutment. And you can see it on the upper right of the screen where it's inserted. 
Um, these things are great for maintaining papilla, even in cases where I don't put a, a provisional crown on right away. In the middle of the screen there, you can see just after chair side modification. And then of course, you know, I pull it out, give it to your assistant, get it, get it polished and put back in. So I'm gonna get into the case studies. Again, this is all about treating people and not teeth. And here we have um, two very wonderful people um, on the uh, left side of the screen. You'll see uh, a fractured number eight. And on the uh, right side of the screen, you'll see a porcelain fused to metal crown number 10. Both of these in need of a dental implant. Preoperative people conditions. Um, our number eight on the left side of the screen, very young male, uh, sophomore in college. He's a uh, distance and track runner for Division I University. Uh, his medical history is insignificant. He has a dental history of good regular care, good oral hygiene. His biggest concern after getting an implant and a tooth is when can I run? When can I run again? And he's just overall psychologically, he's just kind of a cool dude, nice kid. Um, he's got a really super cool Canadian mother who's really funny about being Canadian and being married to an American down here. And they're all around just great people. On the right side of the screen, we've got a young female. Uh, she's a teacher in the area. She has a insignificant medical history, dental history. She has regular care, great oral hygiene. She has a very dental high dental IQ. Um, she is now a teacher in Virginia Beach, but she previously worked in the dental profession for years in Manhattan, New York, in a cosmetic practice. So she understands dental history, or dental um, procedures very well. She uh, has concerns about her tooth. Um, she's had three. She's had three apicos because she wanted to avoid an implant. She knows the risks with her high smile line and cosmetics. Um, psychologically, uh, she's a very nice young woman. She has understandably high expectations and concerns. Um, she has high anxiety going into it, but she is very reasonable and a, and a very nice person. So psychologically, they're both a go for immediate placement and immediate load. Um, to moving right along. So I have to take into account their treatment plan and their smile design and preoperative considerations. With our number eight, we have a exceedingly high smile line, which is unfavorable. But we have a very thick biotype, <clears throat> which is favorable. Uh, architecture, moderately scalloped, so that's not too bad. Uh, our proportions, I suspect there was a diastema here, which uh, I, was, I was right about. So there has to be some discussion about the final restoration. Uh, the tissue heights, in this case, we have excess tissue in the number eight region. Um, this tooth was actually, uh, you'll see later, it had a previous endo endodontic procedure and a crown placed. I suspect probably didn't have a very good feral because it, the tooth got broken off in a uh, basketball game. His expectations are just, yeah, whatever, Get him, give me a tooth. <clears throat> On the number 10, we again have a high smile line, so that's gonna be difficult to manage. We have a thin, smooth biotype, so that's not very favorable. Uh, we have highly scalloped architecture. We have uh, tissue zenith problems. Number 10 is already taller than number seven, the contralateral tooth, just a little bit. Um, and we have to consider that it's very difficult to even maintain that tissue height. So we have to be very careful. And the patient expectations, again, I said they're very high, understandably, with her dental history. Of course, you can imagine, you know, during the consultation when I looked at her smile and her young age and um, her concerns, I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> it's gonna be a pretty hard case, but we, uh, you'll see how it turned out. So her preoperative occlusal condition, considerations. Uh, number eight, you got to look at the opposing dentition. We have a rotated central incisor. Uh, can we enamel plasty it? Yes, we can. Uh, we get permission for that in advance. Um, so are there going to be provisional design changes? No, not necessarily. Just make sure it's out of occlusion and all function. Um, now, the cons other considerations, we'll talk about the diastema later. Um, there was brief discussion about the number nine at the consultation. Do we want to have a diastema? Do we want to have a three-quarter crown or crown there placed there to close the diastema? Are we going to have a wide tooth number eight? 
Uh, I guess I'll have to tell you to stay tuned so you can see what we did at the end. In the number 10, we have on the opposing dentition a rotated canine. <clears throat> I'm not going to want to enamel plasty that canine. It's already looking a little short in the, in the mouth on that side, just a tad bit shorter than the 23, I guess, uh, due to the rotation. So are we going to make provisional design changes? Yes, we are. Um, other, con other considerations, you know, we talk about the patient's expectations and the, and the warnings on that um, in advance. Is this going to be, a, is this going to have any pink porcelain on it or is it just going to be FP1? Um, I feel confident I can get a crown in there without pink porcelain, but I have to let her know that right up front in the beginning. Um, saving the papilla is going to be uh, paramount. It's vital, especially in a young female with a high smile line. We have to maintain that architecture. Just a little look at the uh, at the number eight again, and the uh, showing. I probably should show this later on, but just showing how wide that space is in general versus how short the teeth are. Just kind of a boxy um, look to them if we close that gap. Looking at the bone conditions in this case, in these cases, this is your preoperative bone condition uh, on the left side of the screen. That's your number eight for the uh, track basketball star had endodontics placed. Um, did not have a post put in place, which is an, a topic for another discussion, whether you would want one of those or not. But uh, this is awesome pre-implant therapy, in my view. Um, again, just dislodge that crown on a basketball game. And here's the planning with, a, with an implant there, um, roughly at about a 17 degree angle. And then here's the number 10 towards the middle right of your screen. You'll see the PFM crown with a long post placed. Um, I'm sure it's likely that that post may have caused a root fracture. It looks like it's placed buckly. And the patient reports three apicos. Looks like um, we do see evidence of a blunted root there. So again, we have to make considerations for extraction of that tooth atraumatically, that there is a uh, strong likelihood that the apex of that root will fracture off during extraction. Um, but fortunately for this case, it, it was a shallow extraction site. And then on the right side of the screen, there's planning for what it looks like a 16 millimeter long 3.75 uh, neodent aqua helix implant. All of our treatment planning wouldn't be complete <clears throat> without a full digital workflow. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through um, our planning for digital uh, surgical guides. Is that's probably a topic for another case or a lecture. Uh, you can spend hours talking about that, but we do, I do use an in-office, um, I do use a surgical guide in my office for all implants uh, placed, um, such as singles or doubles. Um, I design them myself, we print them in our own printers, and here's, uh, here's one such example of the surgical guide digitally, um, but they really help in your provisional abutment selection in your crown, in your crown selection at the end. Going to have to make considerations for uh, the, in the provisional planning, number eight. Again, I use Blue Sky Plan to plan the, both of these. Um, we use digitally designed guides in office, printed surgical guides with our FormLab 3D printers. Um, on the number eight, I ended up placing a Neodent Grand Morris, or I was planning, I should say, a Neodent Grand Morris um, Aqua Helix 4x16. Uh, my provisional. I planned it at a 17 degree angle. So I plan to use a 17 degree anatomical abutment um, as my provisional abutment, which can also be used as a final abutment. And I milled, uh, we were planning to mill our, our temporary crown in Emacs in, a, in our Z4 mill. On the 10, same type of workup. Uh, in this case, I was planning a 3.75 by 16 millimeter implant. Um, I was planning to use a uh, provisional tie base and a uh, direct um, composite resin. <clears throat> these are two of our printers in our office. We've um, recently added about a year ago. These are FormLab 3B printers. Um, and I think they, they work phenomenally, very, very nice. So onto the surgical phase. In the surgical phase, of course, ensure a proper sterile field, and I always have two surgical assistants and anesthesia, it goes without saying. Um, but in these cases, I'm going to want to not raise a flap. I want to maintain the blood supply to the buccal plate. 
Um, I'm also going to want to have an atraumatic extraction because I want to maintain the integrity of that buccal plate. It's imperative that the, you do not remove any bone with your extraction. Uh, if you do remove bone with your extraction, especially the buccal plate, it's probably a better idea to graft and wait and delay placement. So this is the tooth root of the number eight, I believe, on your screen there. We're gonna to wanna to go into surgical phase again, implant placement, again, with our surgical guide in place after our atraumatic extraction and buccal plate intact. We're gonna create our osteotomy uh, with our, these, this is a neodent guided uh, surgical kit. And then I'm going to use PRF in many of my surgeries, like I did in this case. I always place PRF ahead of my implant. Uh, in uh, especially in high risk cases or immunocompromised or uh, compromised patients in general, for sure. Um, if uh, for those of you that are placing implants without a guide, as I did for for many years, um, you can a couple of tips. You can use a periodontal probe to follow the palatal plate and gain the inclination of that plate, and then you can use a round burr to uh, to divot in the lingual wall towards the palate palatal plate to get a starting point for your osteotomy drills, for your pilot drill and then your osteotomy drills. So again, continuing on with that, we place, um, I'll place, after I drill my osteotomy, I'll put uh, a large osteotomy drill in the osteotomy site, and then I will pack bone facially on the, uh, on the facial wall of the implant. Um, in this case, I'll use dense cortical bone or bovine bone. Um, I do not use cancellus between a uh, implant and the, and the buccal plate. It's important to use a slow resorbing uh, bone that will maintain the buccal plate um, uh, after implant placement. But I'll use that osteotomy drill so that I can place the bone graft. And that way later, I don't have to try to work my way in and around the implant to push bone graft into the old socket um, facial of the implant, because sometimes it can be quite narrow at the neck and much more open as you go apically. Um, so I'll remove that osteotomy drill and then I'll place that implant. And if we have primary stability, then we can load and provisionalize the implant. So uh, implants in place, and it's time to create a provisional. Um, in this case, uh, I've got that 17 degree uh, anatomical abutment, such that you see it down here on the bottom right of the screen. There's an illustration of that from Neodent. I place it on the implant, and I'm going to go right to the mouth. Just to give my laboratory a head start, um, I'm going to prep the facial of that back just a little bit. And then I'll be able to uh, take it out and, and finish the restoration in the laboratory. I take an open level, uh, open an implant level open tray impression um, at the surgical setting. Uh, my laboratory can then use an analog and uh, they can use that abutment to create a restoration uh, that same day. I, I can do these chair side. I just find them a lot easier to do with better contours and better margin in our in-office laboratory just across the hallway. So while they're working on that, we're going to, you know, clean out the site, make sure it's, it's free of any debris, and we're going to bone graft again with our PRP. So these are our two provisionals in place. We've got uh, on the left side of the screen, the number eight provisional. And on the right side of the screen is our number 10 provisional. That's right after, uh, right after surgery. Just a picture of the, of the provisional abutments. Again, the number eight, 17 degree anatomical that I prep back. I mostly prep that back a little extra to give more room for uh, the restorative material for a better color and shade matching to try to get that titanium away from the uh, buccal con contour of the tooth there. But there's an x-ray on the lower left of that Emax crown provisional fitting. 
And then on the right side is the number 10 on a tie base that was fabricated in my laboratory on the same day. And here's a couple pictures of these provisionals one week later on the left side of the screen, the number eight. And I, I think it's always handy when the uh, shade is just a hair off to a little clinical tip, ask your assistant to take a blurry photo. That's gonna, that'll help out a lot. <laughs> and on the right side of the screen is our number 10. We talked earlier in the preoperative treatment planning phase about modifications of the provisional for occlusion. We did not want to enamel plasty that lower tooth. And in this picture, you can see how we shortened that provisional and we modified the distal aspect of the number 10. Six weeks in my practice, it's common. It's, it's a rule actually to bring a patient back six to eight weeks later for a radiograph, make sure that they're doing all right. Make sure that they have no signs or symptoms of lack of integration. Um, you know, just make sure that they're not quote suffering for four months in silence. Um, you know, because early on in my career, you'd have patients that would be gone four months, come back to get a uh, final restoration, and find out that it's not integrated, and they might have known something was off all along, but they didn't tell you. So here we are, six weeks later, we've got our provisional uh, number eight on the on the bottom half of the screen. Um, we've got great soft preservation of soft tissue architecture on that. From the photo you see there, the radiograph still looks very much like it did the day of surgery. On the upper part of the screen, we see the tie base in place on the uh, neodent aqua helix implant. Um, and the crown looks a little absent because we used an acrylic in the rate. So the radiograph, you can't see it there very well. But again, on the, on the upper middle of the screen, top right picture, you can see that provisional still maintaining that soft tissue architecture very beautifully. So now we're on to the final restorative phase. Um, of course, the goal is to get an aesthetically acceptable outcome. Um, we, we have to make considerations and decide, are we gonna use screw retain or cement retain? What kind of material are we gonna use? Maybe Emacs or Zirconia. So let's have a look. Here we go. We're number eight. This is the uh, transfer pin in place, open tray uh, impressions for all these that we're doing analog. Um, you also obviously have the option of a fully digital workflow, which we, we do in our office uh, very much nowadays. Um, but in these cases, I like to have, have a model, a soft tissue model. Um, and rather than sending out for that um, through a digital approach, we're gonna make an analog impression with our Impergum. Um, again, this implant was planned at a 17 degree uh, angle um, because that's the only place that you could put an implant in that bone was at a perfect 17 degrees. Uh, so that was the only choice we really had. So our options for the final restoration were either cementable or screw retained. Again, being cementable at 17 degree anatomic abutment with Emacs crown is simple and e easy to make. Um, or you can use a tie base with a custom zirconia coping to, you know, make a custom. We could actually, nowadays, I didn't put this on the slide, but we can uh, mill a custom abutment in our office, in our uh, Zircon Zahn uh, Z4 mill. Um, or the other choice was a screw retained restoration. An angulated screw channel was available from Neodent. So here are those pictures of those options. The uh, top middle of the screen is our angulated screw channel um, tie base. And on the bottom right, you see that 17 degree anatomic abutment. In the middle of the screen is a standard tie base. Um, so he was already wearing a final abutment. And my original plan was just to take that final abutment to finish. I was going to have one, but one abutment for the provisional and for the uh, final restoration. But I noticed, um, I became aware that Neodent released their angulated screw channel abutment. And I thought this was a great chance to have a screw retained restoration and, and to, uh, to play with the new toys that were available to me. So that's, that's what we did with that. Um, so we tried with the crown, we tried Emacs. Uh, shade matching was, was a bit of an issue with with this young patient because there were several several shades on both 
adjacent teeth and across the arch and a lot of characterization. I tried a couple of Emax crowns and they just weren't 100%. Um, so ultimately we decided on something different. And there is a slide, probably one out of place, but there's that angulated screw channel. Um, having laboratory su support in office uh, is key for uh, these difficult shade matchings. Um, I'm blessed to have the support of um, several lab techs and a lot of uh, equipment that we have at our disposable, disposal, but um, none more val valuable than the experience of a good artist. Um, so here we took a, we have a zirconia crown on number eight. Um, the diastema, let's talk about that for a second. Um, he had that diastema to begin with. And as we got to the end, we talked about prepping the other tooth and he wanted the diastema closed first of all. And we talked about prepping the other tooth for a three quarter crown. And uh, it just because he was so young, he and his mother didn't really want us to to mess with that tooth very much. So we have a slightly wider tooth. And uh, this is a the, my last picture, I'll go back. I apologize for the flash off the front of the front tooth. Um, so, you know, you know how it is in your practice, whenever you want a great picture, you uh, you try to get, you know, it's just to take a picture and you get, you get a flash off the front of it, of course. So we brought him back and we have a great, great picture again. Um, this is a zirconia crown stained by our resident lab tech, CDT, MDT. And uh, I think it turned out phenomenal with the uh, soft tissue architecture that you see there preserved and the uh, shade matching that can closely mimic that number nine while blending well with the six and seven. Moving on to the final restorative phase of number 10. Um, this was planned also at about a 17 degree angle. I think it's, it's always amazing and funny how that 17 degrees uh, can come up frequently in the anterior maxilla. Um, but this was uh, provisionalized as a cement retained um, with a milled PMMA provisional over top of a tie base. So we took the uh, impression and we had options for this, this person, which is the most important thing, this person who wants to have a very nice, beautiful smile. We could use the, the same 17 degree anatomical abutment and use a cementable crown, um, or we could use a tie base, or we could use this, well, the angulated, let me back up and say, at that point in time, I wasn't aware that there was a release on the angulated screw channel, if it was available. So here are our options again. Um, she was already wearing the tie base abutment with the provisional. And so we decided to keep it in the same line. We had saved everything, you know, in our digital workflow. And so it was really a very, fairly seamless um, restoration from that, uh, from, from there on. This is the final abutment for the number eight crown, I believe. And uh, this, this is a, no, I'm sorry, this should say number 10, I apologize. This is a 0 0.8 tie base uh, with a zirconia coping uh, alluded to that and a milled crown over top of that in Emacs with our staining and glazing done in office. So here we are from provisional to final. Um, we'll see more of that later. And so her timeline, um, we started that in June, June 12th for a consultation at the top of the screen. And a couple of weeks later, we were in surgery and creating a provisional. And then on the right side of your screen, you'll see the one week uh, exam x-ray there. And then in August was our six to eight week exam. And then in January, we did our final impression and delivery and uh, another visit to come back and change the shade. I think on January 25th, she said, you know, it really is very good. I like it very much. Uh, you can so you can, it's done. And I was saying, well, let's put it on provisional cement. I'm not quite 100% happy. Um, we may want to change that shade. She came back a few days later. She said, yep, that's right. Let's, let's change that again. So we made a few changes to the uh, shade in the final delivery. On the other uh, timeline, around the same time, May 21st, uh, 2020 for a consultation. In June, we were in for surgery and provisional and we delivered our Emacs provisional. And in June, we were still in June for the one week exam. 
in August, again, around the same time frame, we did our six to eight week exam. And there's the x-ray on the right side showing that uh, implant in place. And then in November, we took a final impression. And I believe, uh, I believe we lost him due to Christmas or COVID or something for a month. But uh, we did a delivery, attempted delivery on January 14th. And if we did a, a final shade matching and final delivery on the, on the 18th. This is our uh, patient with the number 10. These are her final photographs. Uh, you can see there, we're quite proud of the work on the bottom right of the screen with the shade matching looking very natural in that photograph. And you can't even, in my mind, I can't even tell that it's a prosthetic. And another picture very close up of that same number 10, just to show you the architecture around the tooth. I believe these were taken around the day of delivery. So on the day of delivery, so we have a little bit of redness there as we, you know, we had just delivered that crown, but it looks uh, very nice. And it, with that, I wanna say thank you for uh, joining me tonight and thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the case presentations. Again, uh, please uh, humble me and look us up on uh, social media, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, I will take any questions you might have. Dr. Arnold, Arnold says, thank you. And James says bravo. <laughs> so Thanks, it doesn't Jamie. look like, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay, go ahead. So it doesn't look like we have too many questions, um, but thank you again, Dr. Hogan, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. It's really appreciated. Um, so, and thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Stay safe and uh, have a good rest of your night. Thank you.